only Friday night. All of us that are joined here together to celebrate the day that we all do celebrate. Welcome to Sam Roberts now. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's had an absolutely fabulous week because we've got so much, so much to discuss today. At some point, I'm sure Hot Dog will be on that big Lonely Tron as he is just about every week. But um, yeah, it's been an interesting week. A lot to break down, uh, a movie trailer that we're going to have to discuss. But before we get there, of course, thanks to everybody that's been reaching out, all the uh, uh, Gustavo Fring, Giancarlo Esposito interview clips that, that went everywhere on in, you know across all the news media in the last day or two. It's been fun watching all the coverage and everything. But um, there's two types of coverage. You know, sometimes it's like, okay, and every time that coverage starts to roll, you're like, okay, there's going to be a lot of people using my name. You start running through your head like, what did I say? What did I do? I think that's fine. I think that's fine. No, we should be good. I was just a normal human being asking normal human being questions. And because of that, I shouldn't have anything to worry about. That's not always the case. Sometimes interviews and questions and things like that become newsworthy and pressworthy because of the answers that are given by the person that you're talking to. These are the best. It means that you've done your job and, and you're speaking to somebody that's interesting. Other times, other times it's not as good. Other times something becomes newsworthy because of the way the, the, the question was asked. That's what happened in Indiana this week. Uh, I don't know if you've been following this, but of course, uh, after an amazing uh, year, uh, an amazing performance, the NCAA Women's Finals, Caitlin Clark uh, has become a professional. She's gone to Indiana. She's officially become a member of the WNBA Indiana Fever team, and there's all kinds of controversy about pay and things like that. And, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but she went to Indiana and I, I, I think she's been having a great time. You know, it seems like for the most part, there's a couple of people who of course have to be different and have to figure out their own angle. And, and for the most part, it's kind of blowing up in their faces, but for the vast majority of people, they're all just saying, you know, this is great. We get to see somebody who is great at a thing that they do. And I have advocated for this more than once on this very program, that if somebody is great at a thing that they do, just allow them to be great and, and enjoy witnessing it. And I think this is what we have with Caitlin Clark. We, we haven't seen somebody performing at this level. You see what I'm saying? But unfortunately, you know, people don't know how to handle themselves. People don't know how to act. And maybe it's an Indiana thing. I, I mean, I think Indiana's had some big stars, for God's sakes. Pat McAfee has created an entire empire coming out of Indiana. And still, Caitlin Clark shows up. And I was going to say some of these reporters, but it was it was one specific. They went to a reporter for a publication called The Indiana Star. His name's Greg Doyle. And Greg Doyle uh, got to ask Caitlin Clark a question as she, uh, for the first time, spoke to the press as a member of Indiana's WNBA team. Hi, Hi. Caitlin, uh, Greg Doyle, Indy Star. Big moment, Greg, Greg Doyle, Indy Star. Big moment. It's Greg Doyle, Indy Star. And Greg Doyle knows the whole world's watching. The spotlight's on. It's time for you to shine. And I see some comments chiming in that says Greg Doyle rules. You're confused. No, it's not. It's O is who you're thinking of. O. Doyle historically rules. Greg Doyle. You take the O out of O. Doyle and all bets are off the table, as you'll see in this clip. Let me do this. You like, you like that? So already it's a little uncomfortable, right? Greg, what Greg Doyle is doing is he's doing this. I guess like uh, Caitlin Clark makes a heart gesture with her hands to her family. And whenever she's, you know, whatever, playing and they go to see her and everything. And she, it's, it's something she's become known for. You see it on the television. It's exciting. A lot of people saw it on television. I think for like the first time ever, 
I don't know. The women's NCAA finals in the television ratings just eclipsed the men's finals uh, in terms of, you know, the sheer number of people watching. And most of that was because of this person right here, this athlete right here, Caitlin Clark. But so the first thing, I mean, can you imagine a journalist sitting there going like, let me do this. See, I know who you are. I know the thing that you do. Okay. I've heard, uh, I've heard the press was tough here in Indiana, but I didn't realize they were going to be that tough, but it goes on. It goes on. And she's already like, what do you want? Well, you like that? <laughs> like, I kind of love that response. You like that? You like when you, you like when I do that? I, we, what are we talking about here? What do we, what are we, what are we doing? Perfect example of that. Go first row on the right there for Greg. Hi, Caitlin, uh, Greg Doyle, Indy Star. Real quick, I'll do this. You like, you like that? <laughs> you like that? Like, uh, what did you want me to say? No, this is the thing. The thing that you do? You know, the thing from the show. I'm doing it now. All right, you said your name was Greg? Okay. How would you like me to respond? I mean, like, if I was like, yeah, Sam Roberts, I'm here to, who has a question? And somebody was just like, hey, the last professional broadcaster. I go like, yeah, what, yeah, mm hmm was that the question? That was not the question. Greg Doyle has has more up his sleeve. I like that you're here. I like. Yeah. Oh, I, this is this is. Let's watch it in context. I like that you're here. What? Like you like that? I like that you're here. I like yeah. that you're here. I do that at my family after every game. So. Uh, family. Okay. Well, Pretty let's cool. start doing it to me, and we'll be able to get along just fine. So, question is. What? Start doing that to me and we'll get, are you shooting your shot? What are you doing? Can you imagine you're, you're Caitlin Clark and you just, you made the decision to go to Indiana and you realize that you've got to share your state city town with Greg Doyle. It was like, look, she just said, that's a thing I do to my family. And he's like, me too. <laughs> like what? It's so weird. It's just weird. It's not even, it's just one of those, it's, it's a, it's, it's an ick thing. You know, they say the ick, it's icky. Real quick, I'll really do this. You like, you like that? Oh, I like that you're here. I like that you're yeah. here. Honestly, you know what it is? It's hot dog energy. Hot dog would do something like this thinking he's charming. Cause I think that's what it is. I don't think Greg Doyle meant anything by it. I think that this is, I think he might have thought he was being charming. It's not charming. It's the opposite of charming. It's like, let's lock this guy up before, like, this is this is some minority report stuff. Like, clearly, there's nothing illegal about this, but I don't trust that there's not going to be something far creepier going further. Let's let's stop it right now. That in my family after every game, so... Okay, well, let's start doing it to me. We'll be able to get along just fine. So, oh, the question is, you you didn't have to turn pro. I kind of I don't even know what the question. So immediately, people are going like, you know, what was that? People are asking in the chat, how old is Greg? That's weird. He's an older guy. He's got like a gray goatee. I saw a picture of him. Like he's been in Indiana for like a long time, like years and years and years. Reporting on sports. Caitlin's like, I mean, she's a young athlete. She's going like, wow, wow. You and I will be just fine. <laughs> as long as you do a heart gesture to me too. Okay, it's kind of reserved for my mother who raised me, but that's that's cool. Yeah, and then so like, uh, you know, everybody picked up on this thing. Dave Portnoy was calling him a pervert. I mean, it was it was tough. It was tough for old Greg Doyle. Not one person was like, oh, I see what he was going for because nobody saw what he was going for. Nobody was like, oh, I get it. I haven't heard one person. Nobody's come to his defense. So he puts out his column, you know, he apologized on Twitter first on X and said that, you know, he was wrong. He's sorry. He shouldn't have done it. 
And then he goes on his uh, column and he goes, uh, <laughs> I mean, all the language, too, in the apology is very much like he researched apologies. You know, like he almost like like AI'd, like he chat GPT'd what an apology should sound like. And then when, uh, oh, OK, uh, uh, this is what it's supposed to be. Right. And so uh, uh, he goes. I'm devastated. Okay, because that's tip number one. Tell them that you're upset. Tell them you're not doing well. I'm devastated to realize that I'm part of the problem. Okay? This is 101. This is Apology 101. He's hitting all the check boxes so far. I screwed up Wednesday. Accountability, right? Make sure within the first two sentences, you've taken accountability. There it is. Accountability. I screwed up Wednesday during my first interaction with number one overall draft pick, Caitlin Clark of the Indiana Fever. See what he's doing there? Second sentence, he's putting respect on her name, giving her her credibility. He is backtracking as quickly as humanly possible. What happened was the most me thing ever. Now, this is where it gets interesting because he is taking accountability, but he's trying to skew the narrative into like, Oh, this silly old Greg again. And again, the, he's the only source that I've got like, oh, this is his shtick. This is what he does. He's just, uh, he's just being, he's being, he's being Greg. Greg's will be Greg's. Uh, the most mean thing ever in one way. I'm sort of known locally, sigh. He wrote the word sigh. Huh. For having awkward conversations with people before asking brashly controversial questions. Okay, this is key, right? Brashly controversial. So this is the shtick. I say something awkward, then I then I go for that jugular. I go for something brash and controversial. He says, I've done this for years with Colts coaches Chuck Pagano, Frank Reich, and Shane Steichen. I've done it with Purdue players Carson Edwards and Zach Eady. I did it with IU's Romeo Langford, talking to them as people, not athletes. Notice something about all those names? They're all men. See, this is what he's saying now. He's seen the error of his ways. And so what I did was I said, wait, let me stop right there. Before I just take him at his word, he was going to ask something brash and controversial, right? Okay. Let's see how brash and controversial the question was about to get very controversial because I realized this is the mistake so many people make. They just read the headline and go. I go, I need to see what he was about to say to properly add context, right? Okay, well, we'll start doing it to me and we'll be able to get along just fine. So okay, so that's the awkward weirdness. And now it's time to get brash and controversial. Question is, you, you didn't have to turn pro. I kind of thought you would no matter what, but... How much did Indiana have the number one all pick because of the things you said and the driving distance to Iowa, just everything? I'm just wondering what role that might have played. Okay. I'm surprised Caitlin Clark is even still in Indiana after a controversial, brash question like that. Just out of curiosity, did geography play a part in your decision to come to Indiana? Oh, I see. So you start them awkward and then bang! Go for the geography. What's he talking about? How can you say that? You asked the follow-up question. It's one thing if he hadn't gotten to the follow-up question. And he goes, that's just my steez. That's my style. I ask something weird, and then I go for something very controversial. Well, the weird thing is definitely there, but not the controversial. So then I started looking up like, oh, okay. There must be a history of him asking people weird questions and talking to them as people. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find one thing. This was, and then I found this. Years and years ago, it was recorded off TV. It's not even a good recording. He had a, 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 an interaction with Jim Beheim, the great former Syracuse coach. And this is, let's see, let's see. So this is what we're listening for. He goes, because to, to him, brash and controversial is geography. So he goes something awkward, like maybe he asked Jim Beheim out on a date. And then he goes, nope. But what I really want to know is, are you in Syracuse for the snow? <laughs> I 
I don't know. Let's see. Let's find out. And we have one on the aisle in the middle. Hi, uh, Greg Doyle from CBS Sports. It's Greg Doyle. When do you think you'll decide, announce, whatever, whether or not you're coming back next year, or do you already know? I haven't even said it. Why would you? Why would you ask that question? You, until I've expected from you, I know you. Why ask that question? Do you ask? Do you ask John Beeline? That? So he's basically uh, that, that not what he described at all. I mean, it's not even that. He's like, when are you going to know when you're coming back or not? And Jim Beheim's like, well, that's a real dumb question. Next. May, look, I don't live in Indiana. Maybe there is a history of this stuff. I didn't see anybody going, listen, Greg's just being Greg, and you got to let Greg Greg sometimes. I didn't see that. It's Greg with two Gs and then Doyle, like, Y-E-L. It's just a, the whole thing is odd to me. But I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he'll be fine. He's just, well, Bo no zombie says it best. He's just an ass. And that's okay sometimes, right? I think it's okay to just, let's, let's all get together and acknowledge this guy. It's kind of a weirdo and an ass. And now we know, and that's important. Caitlin Clark, uh, everybody's all in her business. This has got to be the worst part about being a professional athlete that like everybody is like talking about her salary and then how much she's like, everybody knows all the numbers. I don't know why athletes have to deal with that. Everybody knows the numbers of what her base salary is. Everybody knows the numbers of what her endorsement deals are. Everybody knows everything. So I'm getting that in the WNBA, they don't pay well compared to other uh, sports. She's making 76 grand or so base salary for the first year. She signed like a multi-year deal that'll go up to 97 grand. Now that is absurdly low for somebody like Clay Caitlin Clark. And if the WNBA can't figure out how to make money with Caitlin Clark on their television show, I don't know what they're doing. They're in the wrong business. If you have a women's national basketball association and Caitlin Clark is on your court and you can't figure out a way to make money off of that so that you can pay more than 76 grand to her. I don't exactly know what business you're in, but regardless rules are rules, right? The finances are set. There are caps. I guess it is what it is, but there should be something written in there. Like she goes, yeah, but then I'll get a piece of this or a piece of that. Or, you know, when the, when the, when the money comes in from the commercials, because otherwise if all goes according to plan, she's going to bring in a ton of money and eyeballs for the WNBA. And hopefully people after her will get paid a whole bunch of money. But they are saying she's going to get like, a, you know, she's already got like a multi-million dollar uh, endorsement deal with, I don't know, a couple of companies. And uh, it looks like she may be in line to get an eight-figure deal from Nike. Which again, if I've got an eight-figure deal uh, uh, coming from Nike, it's nobody's business. Why does everybody know all these numbers? But so she'll make it up and and... I guess a lot of people are making judgments on that. I feel like if there's anybody that's going to make an eight figure deal from Nike, it should probably be a, a game changer on this level, but I'm happy for her. She should be making crazy money. She's got the whole world talking and Greg Doyle with his head on upside down. So we'll see. We'll see. It's a very, very interesting time. Um, you know, it's not just an interesting time in the world of sport. It's an interesting time in the world of tech as well. Have we heard about this gadget? This gadget, the Humane AI pin. And this gadget uh, made a ton of news over the last, uh, you know, week or so. Uh, because the deal is, it's, it's a pin, you know, you wear it on your shirt. It's got like a magnet back. Uh, and it looks, I guess the, the, the reason it looks like that is probably because I think they use like, Old, like, Apple designers help design it. But everybody that has gotten hands-on with it says it's an amazing piece of hardware. Says that uh, the tech behind it, well, you know, like, the, the feel of it is really great. What it is is it's a, it's a pin that you're supposed to wear on your shirt, right? It's got a camera on it with a light so you know when the camera's on. So you can't just surreptitiously record people. But the camera will take short video clips. It will take photos. But what it will also do is when you ask it to, it'll look at your surroundings. It's also got the capability of projecting. So you can put your hand in front of it and it'll project like a, a screen, some details, whether it be the time, the temperature, you can program it, a text message, various different things. 
But the reason it's an AI pin is because when you tap it like that, you just kind of turn it on when you tap it. It's off usually. It doesn't just stay on all the time. But when you tap it, you can ask it any question you want, and it'll go through. It's got various uh, AI tools that they say are built into it, and it'll look up your answers. You know, in the in the in the video that they showed, you can even be like walking outside. You tap it. You go, "What's that building right there?" And because there's a camera on it, it'll tell you what the building is. Hey, how tall is this building? When was this building built? Just give it a little tap, tap 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 a roo. That's all you got to do, and it'll tell you everything you want to know. You could tap it. You could say, uh, hey, when does Caitlin Clark start uh, uh, playing for the Indiana Fever? It will tell you, hopefully, if it works. And it could be a real game changer, right? Problem is, all the big tech reviewers are saying that it stinks. Marquez Brownlee, the infamous MKBHD, this guy is the top tech reviewer in all of the internet land. He says... It's the worst product he's ever reviewed. Like his review for it was so bad. It's now drawn into question whether it's uh, uh, moral for him to do reviews that are that bad. He's become so influential on the internet that a bad review like that can completely tank a company. So is it morally right for him to have a review that's that bad? And I mean, the answer is, of course it is. The problem is not the review for the product. The problem is the product. If he's doing, if anybody is doing negative reviews dishonestly to purposefully tank a company, well, then that's a real problem. But if a company puts out a bad product and it gets into the hands of a reviewer or the product doesn't work as advertised or the product is just not ready for public consumption and it gets into the hands of reviewers, well, the product is the problem, not the person who's talking about the product. That's insane. So apparently like, and it goes back, if you watch the preview video for this pin, when the when the people who work for the company are touching it and asking it questions, they kind of like uh, uh, talk as they're waiting for the, res waiting for, excuse me, waiting for the response. So they'll go like, what's the weather like outside? And you can tell that I touched it and I can just wait now. The weather is, but what you don't realize is the reason that they're talking is because there's a wait time. There's like a lag time. Everything takes time. What they're not really totally clear on with all the excitement when they're talking about the positives is the pin is like $700 and then $24 subscription service. And then it also kind of takes a while. And then also, according to this reviewer, MKBHD, the battery is inconsistent. And, and, and you know... Uh, <laughs> Everybody's just saying it's not ready for public consumption, right? Which I want to see it. I want to try it because it's still, I mean, it doesn't, it seems expensive, but it seems like it could be fun. The thing is, I think that everybody is so excited about AI in general and everybody is like, is, is so ready for the future to be here now. I think we're all overestimating where we're at with AI. AI is this amazing technology, but it seems like every time consumer AI is ready to go, it's not really ready to go. Like for reliable AI that could be with you all the time, it, it's, 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 it's prohibitively expensive and, and, the technology that you would need for it, it just doesn't work. Like they showed in the, in the, in the review for this thing, like it was getting certain questions wrong. It was just, it's not there. And I think that it's almost a relief for people that are afraid of, of AI, because I, I think that we'll get there, but we're not quite as far along as we think we are. I don't think we're that close to AI taking human jobs yet because stuff is just not, people are, are, are waiting for it to be ready now. It's kind of not. Every time you see one of these game changers, the game hasn't quite been changed yet. It's a hypothetical game changer. It's like, yeah, at some point this will work. And at some point it can change everything. But a lot of companies and a lot of people are so eager to change life as we know it 
that they're rushing it. We're going like, we have it now, we have it now, we have it now. And it's like, you know, even, and I think it's a good lesson, right? Because like, even Apple, they weren't the first to have a smartphone out. They weren't the first to have a touch screen out. They weren't the first for any of this stuff. But they did it right. It worked. It worked. At the end of the day, it worked. You you can't fight to be the one who has it out first. You have to fight to be the one who has one out that works the best first. Right, like if, if you're going to rush to get yours out, but it's still going to leave a gaping hole in the marketplace. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Somebody's going to come along and just take your idea, but do it better. So I don't know what's going to happen, man. I mean, this humane AI company is saying, you know, thank you for the feedback. Any feedback is valuable, but it's tough. It's tough. And, 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 People are now trying to jump into the algorithm. So there is a thing where like a couple of influential bad reviews will lead to more bad reviews. And what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is that because the product is bad or is that because people understand where the conversation is going and they want to be a part of the conversation? You don't want to be the one guy. Like, can you imagine the one guy that just didn't catch the flaws? And so he puts out the good review and realizes like everybody else is like, I don't think so. Mm. Not good. Not good. It's tough. But this, this is what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. This might be, this is something that got me very, very excited this week. This smile right here. This creepy Josh Hartnett smile is the thing that got me very, very excited this week. Because we have a new trailer. A new M. Night Shyamalan trailer dropped this week for a movie called Trap. The last time we saw an M. Night movie, it was Knock at the Cabin, starring Dave Bautista. I very much enjoyed that movie. I'm an M. Night fan. I think that M. Night uh, was a victim early on of his own success, meaning that, you know, I see dead people, as the movie has been come to known, uh, was such a game changer, such a success, such a cultural movement that when your whole thing is making movies where there's a twist at the end and your first mainstream movie was that movie that like defined the twist. <sighs> then you get to this place where, well, what am I going to do next? And you almost have to like take the first one out of the equation. So like the follow-up, although the follow-up wasn't the follow-up unbreakable. I loved Unbreakable. It's just a different type of movie. There's a twist in it, sure. But ultimately, Unbreakable is like, I love the whole, so I love the, I call it the the superheroes in real life trilogy that he did between Unbreakable, uh, Split, and Glass. Glass was the worst of the three, but not as bad as people think it was. I like those three. I like the grandma movie, you know, where the kids go and stay with the grandparents. Not that many people saw it, but it was a really good movie. Really good movie. I liked the twist and I liked everything about it. It was super fun. Uh, he came out with a movie during the pandemic where people go to a beach and turn old. I didn't love that one. And maybe it's because I got kids now and it was just a bummer. Like in real life, I'm looking at my kids going, uh, I can't believe how, how quickly they're getting old i can't and then and then i go and turn around and i'm watching this movie where these kids go to a beach and they become teenagers within five seconds i go this is terrible this is terrible you just lost all those all those all those years see pk is saying old was better than i expected it wasn't that it was a bad movie i think it just hit me in a spot where i didn't want to be hit because you're not even even if you can get off the beach you're not getting those years back so i can't i can't really rewatch that but what i mean i, I love a ton of his movies I, and i like that he does his own thing I like that he comes up with his ideas or he, he and his people come up with those ideas. I like that he puts it together. I like that that when an M. Night movie comes out, there's a feel to it. I like all of it. And Trap looks awesome. Trap looks really, really good. So based on the trailer, you've got Josh Hartnett here. And a Josh Hartnett comeback is something that I've been uh, 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 an advocate for. Like, to me, the best part... Okay, Wise says the visit sucks, admit it. Was the visit the grandma movie? I will never admit that. 
Because that's wrong. It's not true. For me, when you go to Josh Hartnett, it's my favorite part of, of, of the Adam Bomb movie. Oppenheimer. Might as well have been called Hartnett. When I realized that Josh Hartnett was getting a comeback opportunity in Oppenheimer, I was a thousand percent sold on it. This guy is a legend. We're going back to late nineties horror. We're going back to the faculty. We're going back to, to rom-coms. We're going back to everything. Okay. I'm here for a Josh Hartnett comeback and look at the guy. He hasn't aged a day in 20 years. Hairline is still there and it doesn't look fake. It's not that weird, distracting. I got the follicle replacement hairline. It's a beautiful hairline. The face is still there. It's great. It's like he's ready to uh, fall in love with Shannon Sossum and all over again. It's it's perfect. So in this movie, Josh Hartnett is taking his daughter. And he looks like he seems like a great dad. He's out in the parking lot doing dad jokes, you know, having a great time. And he's taking his daughter to see this pop star named Lady Raven. It looks like it's her daughter's favorite musical act, right? And they go into this arena and, and he's sitting with her. And clearly this is not his genre of music. This is not his cup of tea, but what's he doing? He's turning around and he's doing something for his daughter. What a great father. And they're watching the songs and I'm sitting in, you know, you realize it's an M night trailer and you go, oh boy, oh boy, there's gotta be something bad that's gonna happen. I don't like this because this is so pleasant, right? And he goes, okay, I got to go uh, hit the head. I got to go use the turlet. You good right here? Daughter says, yeah, I'm good right here. I go, uh-oh, is this where something bad's going to happen? And Josh Hardnett goes up and he pops by the merch booth. And to me, the creepiest part of this trailer is how friendly the merch booth worker is because I have never seen a merch booth worker at a big concert like this, this friendly. But Josh Hardnett is walking around, right? And he's headed towards the merch booth, but he sees out the window. You see there's like cops coming, but not just like cops, like feds, like big, like FBI tanks and stuff like that. And you see cops are inside and they're attaching more security cameras than are usual. They're putting new security cameras in. Josh Harnett's looking around like, what am I seeing here? What's going on here? And he, uh, and he calls the, he, he says, excuse me, sir. And he gets the merch guy over to him and he goes, what's, uh, what's going on? And the merch guy goes, and it's a very M night shot thing. It looks like an M night movie because they're like talking directly into the camera lens as if they're talking to each other. And it's very, uh, disconcerting, disconcerting, disconcerting one of those two. And he goes, uh, what's going on here? And it's very, it's very uh, limo driver in Wayne's world. The merch booth worker has a, a really convenient amount of information, <laughs> like perfect for a trailer. And he goes, don't wrap me up for this, okay? Josh Harnett goes, I won't. I go, that's an amazing amount of trust those two can build that quickly. And he goes, they say the butcher is at this concert. You know, the butcher, the guy who's cutting everybody up. And I'm like, you know, Maybe M. Night was in a rush or something, but he probably could have come up with a name better than The Butcher. Oh, there's a serial killer on the loose. Let's call him The Butcher. Although there is some charm to it, right? It does fit in with that sort of pulpy, uh, uh, almost comic book-esque, like, you know, uh, Mr. Glass was a guy who breaks easily, you know, like it does kind of fit into the M. Night world. So I'm not mad at it, but it is a little like, uh, okay, you didn't, I don't have to really stress my brain to figure out what The Butcher does. But he goes, the guy who's been chopping up people that, that they can't find? Josh Harnett goes, yeah. The guy goes, the feds have a tip. They know he's here. And they're going to find him here tonight. And Josh Hartnett's face turns to concern. And at first, you go, oh, no. Josh Harnett must be worried about his daughter. He's got to save his daughter from the butcher. And then Josh Harnett runs to the bathroom and he pulls out his phone, his cell phone, you know? He pulls out his phone. And he goes, uh, 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 I gotta, I gotta, I gotta uh, check in with something. And he turns on his security cameras, and you realize there's security cameras in his house. And it goes to a video of a guy who appears to be tied up in his basement, a torture victim, as it were. And you go, Oh my God, Josh Hartnett is the butcher. Hot dog, can you believe it? 
Josh Hartnett I, is the butcher. I, I I just got in here. How'd you get me in this thing? I what are you talking about? Josh Hartnett. Oh uh, what? I just woke up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Hartnett's the butcher. Oh Christ. That's what, what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So I'm glad you're here, Hot Talk. You're gonna want to hear this. This is the new M Night trailer. So okay. so so we realize that Josh Hartnett has brought his daughter to a concert. A serial killer is in the arena with him, and he is the serial killer. And you go, oh, my God. A guy this charming. A guy this good looking. He's a great dad, but he's also a serial killer. And then you go to, and then he's back in his seats at the concert. And he's so distracted. He's so stressed out. And his daughter's like, dad, dad. And like his daughter doesn't understand the stress. And what's he going to do? Honey, I'm a serial killer and I'm about to be caught. You got to get off my back right now. Like he's because not only is he like, oh, boy, if they catch me, you know, it's jail forever. I don't care what state I'm in. And I'm also going to have to tell my daughter what I did. She's going to be pissed. We're having the greatest night ever. Honey, it's a long story. Look. Adults do weird things. You know, you try to generalize <laughs> it in a way where it's like, you know, it's right. Hey, everyone does it. Right. And so what it appears is clearly this isn't the twist in the movie, right? Like clearly the twist is not he's the killer because otherwise they gave the it away 45 seconds into the trailer. Like that's, oh that's not the twist. That's the hook. There are two different things here. What's the hook? What's the twist? Knock at the cabin. The hook was these guys are coming to the cabin door. The twist was hands over the ears. They actually are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So. Ah, thanks. Dude. <laughs> sorry, bro. You should have seen it. It was a great movie. <laughs> Support Batista. So. All we get after that is like a lot of tension. And the idea that now we're looking at a movie where what happens if you're in an arena with your daughter who doesn't know that you're a serial killer, but you are a serial killer and you have to escape the building with your daughter still not knowing you're a serial killer, but not getting caught by the feds who are at every exit with cameras everywhere. And I'm going, sold. I have no idea what I would do. This seems so stressful because I've never mm. thought of it from that perspective. I'm always like, we got to catch the serial killer. Not like, but what if you were the serial killer? How stressful would that be? I go, yeah, actually, that would be pretty stressful. You could hide under the bleachers until the show is done. They'll give up eventually. So you think that they'll wait, and then once the show is done, they'll go, forget it. We must have <laughs> lost him. He must I have, see. I mean, he's not, obviously still not here. It's two in the morning. Okay. And you think under the bleachers, as if this is like a high school concert. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Because this is, I'm thinking more like Madison Square Garden. Like, this is a big arena. And you're or, right. Or you, uh, but, but here's the problem. Like here's the, here's the issue with that hot dog. Yeah. How do you explain to your daughter? Cause that's the twist. That's it. Cause you're right. If you're there by yourself, first of all, if you're a Josh Hartnett aged man and you're going to a lady Raven concert by yourself, you should get arrested anyway. I don't know who this lady Raven is, but you do, you need to get arrested anyway. He's with his daughter. So everything he does, he has to explain to his daughter. Which means that if he's hiding under the bleachers until two o'clock in the morning, as was your plan, yeah. uh, how does he explain that to his daughter? Like you chill oh, how here. Old, with how me. old is the daughter? How does she? How does she look like in this? High daughter? school. High school. Okay. High school. You get to the. You you know about things in high school. This is when you find out if the daughter is ride or die. You just got to tell her. And you're like, look. Okay. Well, that's. I mean. This is what I. This is I did. Can you this. imagine having hot dog in the writer's room? What if he tells his daughter immediately? <laughs> like, why? Hey, look, you're going to find out either from me or from the cops in 20 minutes. Look, you're in high school. You know, some people's parents are serial killers. Your parent is one. Who would you rather, who would you rather the, the child hear it from? From you? No. Or from a stranger? And you go like this. You got two choices, okay? Either a dad that's in jail or a dad that is a serial killer, but not in jail. And clearly, I'm not going to kill you. You're my daughter. So help me out here. So what do you want? You want Create no dad, distraction. no dad, no dad, or serial killer dad that's clearly not going to kill you. Right. I took, I mean, I took you to the concert. If I was going to kill you, I would have done it before the show. 
And then you go, I'm going to need you to kill someone outside of the arena so it's, we can divert the resources. That's the end. I'm not going to make my escape. Yeah, that's the issue that once the daughter goes like, okay, I'm ride or die. And you go, okay, well, now that you've <laughs> okay. said that, I need you to do me a couple more favors. <laughs> We're going to be in this thing together going forward. La familia. Yeah. Yeah. No, I and I don't know. I mean, it could be like if it's a traditional M Night movie. I think there's a good chance that the entire movie takes place in the arena. Like that feels like a thing that M Night would do. Like it all, you're not looking at over the course of multiple days. Like it's in real time, two hours, whatever. Like if the movie's an hour and a half, twenty four. Yeah, kind of. Except hundred and eighty, two hundred minutes. Is that the name of the movie? Well, I don't think it's gonna be that long. I mean, 200 minutes is super oh, wait, no, long. That's over three hours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's an M night. We're going about 90, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're probably 90 minutes in and out, I would hope. You know, okay, it's not okay. like, can that's you imagine anyway. like, that premise that I gave you, it's a great premise. But if I was like, yeah, and it's gonna be about three and a half hours, I'd go, what? <laughs> what are you putting every song in from the show? I think we can skip some some time here. No, the opening I, act. Yeah, I think it's all taking, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they're stuck in traffic on the way there. So that's part of it. Um, no, I think it'll probably take place over the course of an evening. And and once either they get out of the arena or they don't, but then it will probably also draw into question, right? If you're following Josh Hartnett the whole time and this is your lead character, what are you rooting for? Are you rooting for him to get caught or are you rooting for him to escape? What perspective are we watching from? This is what I've been waiting for. Remember I told you? In the Scream movies, I wanted them to eventually get to the place where Ghostface is the baby face that we're kind of following. So all of his justifications are, we see it through his or her perspective, which means that we're now on Ghostface's side. Like nothing's really changed. Not necessarily, not necessarily. It's just that we're seeing it from their perspective so they can be painted as the protagonist just doing what they have to do. Or how about he starts as a baby face killer and then as he gets more desperate and desperate throughout the movie right to get out of the situation you're kind of left to the side how far am i willing to, mm. to back this guy up because he's getting more demented and can't justify that killery. like if he kills the real nice guy at the merch booth like that guy was a cool dude you didn't have to kill that dude and now it's like okay oh, right how long like how ride or die are you right okay that's the tagline I don't think that is the tagline because we just made up that part of the plot just now. I look, I jumped into this halfway through. <laughs> okay, no, why. that's fair. That's very fair. <laughs> that's very fair. Uh, I thought we were just theory crafting. Stop. You know I don't like it when you say that. <laughs> August 9th. I mean, this is going to be a great summer for movies. August 9th is when this comes out. The trailer we were talking about last week, uh, Maxine, comes out in July, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be awesome. By the way, before you got here, did you uh, did you, uh, you did you see the clip of the reporter that creeped out Caitlin Clark? I was watching it on. I, I mean, yeah, I saw it on Twitter. I yeah, saw clip on Twitter. I yeah. said that like I was very like hot dog energy. Like I think I'm charming. Well, no, I would have. <laughs> I would have handled that way better. <laughs> Make the heart at me going forward. <laughs> <laughs> no, <ugh. laughs> it's so icky. <laughs> And before we wrap things up, more movie news. Could be terrible news for Shane Gillis. I don't know if uh, he was fully attached or not, but of course, Quentin Tarantino made the bold claim that his, fi his next movie would be his 10th movie, which would be his final movie. He says that directors should only make 10 movies and that he's at the age and, and has the catalog where he doesn't want to make any bad movies. He wants no bad ones. And right now, he is nine for nine. People yeah. have their favorites and not favorites, but what do we got? Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown. Uh, it uh, wasn't Reservoir. It wasn't Kill Bill after Jackie Brown, was it? Or was it? Yeah, it might have been. Might have been Kill uh, Bill, but I think Kill Bill counts as one, right? Wait, Kill Bill. He counts Kill Bill as one. People but then think that's bullshit. He does. You don't. You think that's bullshit? People think that's bullshit. You know whose idea it was to make Kill Bill two movies? Was was it his or was it the studio to divide? I know I exactly the person who suggested it. And this is the person whose side that you're on. Oh, Harvey Weinstein. Oh, that's your guy. 
No, no, it's not my guy. You I'm just said boy. he had all the ideas. Your man's? That's your man. That's your man. You known him for years. <laughs> you grew up with you him. Grew up with him. Uh, <laughs> Kill Bill might have been the fourth. There was Death Proof, uh, Inglorious Bastards, Hateful Eight, Django, uh, Django Unchained, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like there are like every single one of them. He's nine for nine. So, I think he wants to go out like the Undertaker before the streak ended. He knows at some point if he keeps it going. Okay, so he wants to be a stinker. He wants to go out WrestleMania twenty eight. Yes, after the Triple H Hell in a Cell. Yes. Okay. I mean, everybody wants to do that. It's very difficult to do that though. So I have self control. You need a lot of self control for that. Like, yeah, but, maybe everyone thinks they got one more in me. Right. Right. And sometimes you need to be shown you do not. Yes, multiple times. But like I'm I'm of the other camp. Like I want people to go until there is no I mean, you know, I like to go until there's nothing left in the tank, until you're on the side of the road <laughs> with no gas in your car going, so God aid. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ride the lightning, baby. I want to keep going until there is nothing left. You want you want Tarantino to go out like that. A hundred percent. No gas in the tank. None, no gas on the tank. And the insurance company saying, oh, you're on the turnpike? Oh, we don't go on the turnpike. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I want Tarantino watching the solar eclipse from the side of the highway, wishing he could get home because he hasn't slept in five days, but he ran out of gas. That's where I want Tarantino to go to. I want him to make 100 movies. I, I mean, there's a there's a lot between 10 and 100. Maybe we could, maybe we could like I want negotiate. him to go straight to DVD. <laughs> That's where uh, I want Tarantino uh. to be. OK, like I that's, want every idea, every idea that he has. That's all, one way to like this to destroy the myth. He's trying to build a mythology here. Like no, a I want every idea he has. Just make it <laughs> like no, no second guessing. No, nothing. Anything, Any toilet idea. That's right. Anything like you go to bed at night right before you fall asleep. You have an idea. You write it down. No matter how you feel in the morning, make the movie. Every idea. But, so if you see him, all of a sudden you come across a lot of money, Sam, mm -hmm. and all the studios are neglecting, neglecting him and not trying to back him up. He runs to you. You're funding the next stinker. If I win the lottery, I'll give Tarantino. Uh, I'm going to make a wrestling promotion and also give Tarantino all the money he needs. For his, it's going to have to be a big lotto win is what I'm saying. It's going to have to be like yeah. one of those historic lotto wins because I would give Tarantino whatever he wanted to just go like, no, just keep. Keep pumping them out. Like if you don't that would even be your investment, that's how you would invest yeah. your college's fund. A hundred percent. Like if you don't have a script, that's fine. We'll make it up when we get there. <laughs> like, no problem. Like you got this, bro. You got this. Just I think. give me what's in that head of yours, bud. So he was going to do this movie. The movie, you know, there's always stuff that he was going to do. I almost wish they stopped reporting on what he's going to do because there's a whole list of Tarantino possibilities that never happen, you know, like, and some of them are plays, some of them are books. He was going to make a Star Trek movie, you know, all this stuff. Uh, but the latest one was, uh, he was going to do a movie called the movie critic. And this was going to go back to seventies Hollywood, you know, whether it's before or after once upon a time in Hollywood, we don't know, but it may have built on that mythology. And there were people saying that he could have brought back, Brad Pitt's character from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to either expand mm -hmm. on what happened next or how he got to where he got. Because, I mean, he loves that character. In the in the novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he expands on that Brad Pitt character like crazy. Um, but so he had, he had I had an idea. I don't know how far he'd gotten into the writing of this movie. I don't know if he maybe wrote the whole thing. I don't know. But uh, there was this, like, movie critic from the 70s. I guess he was ornery. I don't know. But Tarantino, you know, he grew up with him, not like as a friend, but like reading his stuff. And so this was going to be who the movie was around. They were going to start shooting in like August. And then, you know, this week, Tarantino announces he's not going to do it. But there were also like and again, it is a little like. A, like a game of telephone. First, there was a rumor that Shane Gillis was attached to the project, and that kept going up and up the ladder until people said straight up like. Shane Gillis is the movie critic in this movie. And people were like, oh! And then Quentin was like, we're not making that movie. And people were like, oh. <laughs> it's oh. Stupid. Why, would you, why would you believe that? Oh, that's, that's, that's too bad. Um, 
so yeah, so we're not getting the movie critic. I was hoping it was a live action version of uh, of Jay Sherman, the movie critic. It stinks. But so to be clear, then mm -hmm. we're not getting the movie critic just because he wants to stick to ten movies and he doesn't want he doesn't the want this critic. Right. He's got one movie left, and this isn't the one. So we're not wow. getting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now look. I don't think he, I think he'll make more than 10 movies. I don't think he stays on the sidelines. I, I mean, like you said, it's just too hard. Like he's got like, there's, there's, he's going to have some weird idea. There's going to be some loophole, whether it's another like grindhouse thing where it's like, well, technically I'm doing it with Robert Rodriguez or, or he'll go like, well, no, this is actually a series for Netflix, but each episode is two and a half hours long. And you're like, okay, yeah. No, it's not a movie trilogy. It's a three episode television series for Netflix. That's all. <laughs> that's all that is. Like, I, I don't think, I don't think we're done not yet by a long shot. You know, I mean, there's as long as we're not done creatively with him, as I, long as he doesn't ride well, into the sunset, we're definitely not done creatively with him because he said he wants to write books, he wants to do plays, yeah. but oh, like books. that doesn't count. I'm not reading those shits. But no, it's too long. No, this is pages and pages and pages. But uh, yeah, no, I just feel like. All it's going to take is for somebody to come along and people to be like, yep, that's my favorite writer director. That's the guy now. And Tarantino's going to be like, no, you know, I mean, I'm sure Undertaker wanted to stop at WrestleMania 28, even WrestleMania 29. But somebody was like, now he's the best guy at WrestleMania. And Undertaker was like, nope, <laughs> I'm coming back. He's going to be like, I got a lot left in the tank. Yeah. That's what I do. So I'm, Hopeful. I mean, I want to see everything. Like I said, I want to see all his ideas. Maybe we'll see the movie critic at some point. Maybe it'll be his 11th or 12th or 13th movie. But I do want to see, like, I like that he makes universes and that there are, like, because he comes up with all of his own ideas, you can trace stuff together. You know, like Reservoir Dogs was connected to Pulp Fiction and the 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 brothers, you could trace it back. I think in Glorious Bastard, no, uh, Hateful Eight, I think you could trace it back to. But I loved the idea of making a movie like the movie critic where there is a lineage that traces back to once upon a time in Hollywood. Because once upon a time in Hollywood is so good. So is the movie critic coming in, coming out in any kind of no. format, like a book, nothing, like, uh... nothing that they've said. I mean, it might, but nothing. He hasn't said, no, I'm doing this instead. He's just like, I'm not making that. Yeah. Fuck this shit. Just... It's also great that like Tarantino can do that. Like, Hey, I'm going to make the movie critic. And everybody's like, okay, here's all the money you need. Here's what you need. And then he's like, oh, I'm not making it though. And you're like, oh, okay. all right. All <laughs> I right. I had this well, banger, but I'm not making the banger. I'm not going to do it. They're like, oh, it, did you think it wouldn't? No, it would have been great. I'm it would have been a fucking banger. Yeah. But now it's just for right you'll up never, here. You'll never get it. You never you'll get never it. See I, it. I watch it every day, <laughs> but you can't see it. <laughs> oh, man. Now I'm about now. <laughs> yeah. See, when you think about it like that, like he already has seen the movie in his head, right? That's why all of his ideas, I think, should just be made and no second guessing. Oh. Well, look, if you, I've made a lot of very controversial statements uh, tonight. If you agree or disagree with any of them, if there are more controversial statements to be made, more topics to be hit, every super chat will get read. I already see chats coming in. People thought the first half of tonight's show very strong. I don't know what made <laughs> this. I don't know what the difference was, but. Uh, oh, wow. Look at this. First super chat. Every super chat gets acknowledged here on Sam Roberts now. Every super chat. So if you got a super chat, super chat in. This is coming from Tormenta263. Super wow. chatting in for my lateness. Work sucks. Work sucks, dude. Yeah, right. Okay, sure, dude. You love work. You love your little corporate I life. I love it. You really <laughs> do. Ooh, what's the gossip? Ooh. <laughs> Can you guys make a... Can you guys make an article out of my video? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> PHW. OFL. Hey, not Sam. I really enjoy the satisfying podcast. Any chance you'll get your dad on there? I bet he'd talk about some satisfying things. My dad on the satisfying podcast. I might see. I might. I mean, I guess if there was a call for it, I would do it. Tormented 263. Smash wow. that like or else I'll join the show. Oh, boy. No. You, you guys didn't hit like enough. You Look did what that. What happened? You did that for yourself. You did that to yourselves. You only have yourselves to blame. Uh, Weedenhoff, are you going to watch the 177-minute director's cut of Midsummer? 
I just got my copy today. Also, his hot dog waiting for a girl outside a train station. He was actually. Uh, she's not coming. Spoiler alert. But, I'm still waiting. Man, they remember be here any minute. They remember everything, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you can wear your you can wear your cool guy leather jacket, and they still won't forget. Well, no, no, it's not. It's not a cool. <laughs> you can wear your jacket. awesome dude leather jacket, and they still bring up that old stuff. That's not cool. Um. I don't know about the director's cut of Midsummer, but I would love to watch it. That's like one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, send me the info on that, dude. Not Sam Miguel. <laughs> what? Were you listening on Jim and Sam when I suggested that we dox Miguel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not Sam Miguel writes in, Travis giving out hugs or is this a bait and switch? I'm telling you, I guarantee if you listen to Jim and Sam, you will hear me. I am uncomfortable by the whole thing and I am trying to avoid talking about it it's not that i've forgotten i am trying to move the subject beyond that because i i think it's weird and uncomfortable that's where i stand on it be herb we need an explanation on that jacket hot dog i didn't even know that was there <laughs> it's his cool guy jacket he wants to impress you it's guys. not a cool guy jacket no we have a themed party themed birthday party tonight what's and the I theme to... awesome dudes no it's like red uh rock kind of things so what's put some what rings are you talking about on and red what's red rock no like red red color is the theme is the color theme and it's like rock and roll and it's a whole thing so i i this feels I like cultural like a, appropriation yeah so i bought a rock band t-shirt which is in the mail i gotta go pick it up but I'll throw <laughs> what that rock band on. is it uh i'll tell you uh, I, it might have been creed do you know creed no 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 no. i'll tell you right now right now i'm on amazon okay. oh it was rolling stones you didn't remember it was the rolling stones i i i you know i just grabbed one is that jacket red uh well it, it looks not, not that, red red but oh it know. just looks brown in this light that's the only reason i ask yeah no, maybe, it's, maybe it's just, i think it's my contrast on my tv is that a thriller jacket is that a thriller pockets on it uh it has pockets yeah i was i was <laughs> i was gonna like try to go all red and get pants and shoes and all that stand but... up a little bit that's a thriller jacket that's a michael jackson thriller jacket uh it is <laughs> you got a thriller jacket on <laughs> <laughs> that's all right awesome. so i'm gonna kill it then you are gonna kill it dude there you go who's a bigger rock star than michael jackson and this will be getting returned the next day oh my god i swear <laughs> to god i'm not reading these in advance not Sam Miguel says hot dog <laughs> stole Michael Jackson's thriller jacket. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. That's the vibe. That's what we're going for, baby. And where is this party? Yeah, I mean, obviously you don't have to get the address. Is it in your place? In the BK. Oh, in, oh, it's a Brooklyn party. That's very yes, exciting. A house party. That's very exciting. Bono Zombies, Sammy, when is the summer merch gonna drop? All your shirts are in my regular rotation. I love them. We do need to uh bring in the not Sam Wrestling summer merch coming up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's almost May. We, oh, all right. I got some work to do this weekend. Yeah, yeah you, you got a week or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to, uh, yeah, I will get them out. Uh, Six Crow, our uh, financier, wow. like Jeffrey Epstein, the financier. Uh, appreciate your <laughs> contributions. And he writes in Remember when Kevin Smith was going to stop after Jay and Silent Bob? Nobody retires. That's true. Yeah, Kevin Smith said he was done. Then he said he was done with Jay and Silent Bob. Then he said none of it was true. He said, I'm not going to make any more Clerks. He's done six, seven, eight Clerks movies, you know? And keep making them. I don't have any, I don't, I don't have like, like any qualms about people that just keep going. Keep, do what I, you love. That's it. Let's be honest. Sam Roberts now peaked a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Two men hugging is weird to you. That's not very PC. No, it's the forcing of it. It's the forcing of it that I don't like. Non-consensual. Yeah, hugs. the whole thing is weird to me. It's very Greg oh, yeah. Doyle of the Indiana Star to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, appreciate you guys hanging out, hot dog. You go, you go rock till you drop, okay, my friend? Yeah. Oh, well, you that's got, not very rock. No, it's kind of weird. You got five yeah. styluses. You might as well use them. I'm going to cheers with you later.